live um, not just publicly but privately with you. So, Father, use Ben. Thank you for this, brother. In mm. Christ's name, mm. amen. Amen. Thanks, Ray. And thank you for preaching last week for us on the life, the perspective of the life over God and then leading us to a life with God. We've kind of paused in between series here to take a few weeks on this broader concept, which is the big message. It is the gospel, uh, walking with God and God's love and pursuit of us to commune with us, following a year and a half journey through the story of Exodus, where we found not only a story of God's rescue and deliverance and salvation of a people, but the purpose behind that, that He would come and dwell amongst them and be their God and know them deeply, communing with them, restoring what has been lost and broken. And so we see that it is a microcosm of the big story. Yes, Scripture reveals a story of deliverance, of God's rescue and salvation. That's the what, but the why behind it is vital. The why is really the gospel. The why is communion with God now and forever because God delights in his people and wants to dwell in intimacy with him. That's how it was at the beginning in his creation. It's the picture we're given of the new heavens and the new earth in so many vivid ways by the apostle John. And we are now between those two gardens trying to understand that story and find our story within it. We clung to so many of the promises and God's word to Moses and to Israel in Exodus. Maybe this one at the top of the list. Exodus 33, 14. God saying to Moses after a time of trial and brokenness and division amongst the people, of turmoil happening right in their very camp, Moses interceded on behalf of the people and God said, Yes, I will, basically. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. The very thing that you have spoken, Moses, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And we receive that promise all the way forward to us today because it's the promise revealed and repeated throughout the big story. This is the greatest news of all. If we fail to understand this heart of the gospel that God loves his people, pursues his people, knows them deeply, and desires to make himself known in intimacy, if we fail to understand how we find our own story within that story, then we will continue to try to get to God or draw near to him or relate to him in a false way. Or we'll, we'll receive and, and believe a false gospel, which ultimately becomes a transactional relationship with God. And we either find ourselves striving harder, recognizing the distance between ourselves and God, so we must do more, work harder, or we may find ourselves withdrawing, walking away from God, turning to another pursuit, because the promise we had hoped to find in God or been told we would find, we don't find. The problem is if we come through it from a, from a false gospel perspective, uh, we are not communing with God but transacting with Him. So if we misinterpret the story and misunderstand our own story, then we will take a false posture toward God like Pastor Sky Jatani describes in his book with, that many of you have read or are reading as we journey through this story. It's part of the frame that we've put on this big idea. I think it captures it so powerfully and accessibly for us. And these false postures are a life over God, which we heard about last week, a life under God, which largely fears God. Today we'll look at a life from God posture, which is so prevalent in American Christianity, in our own story. Next week, a life for God. Oftentimes, we just move from those postures to land there. But the gospel is a life with God. That's what we are pursuing. The key thought on the life from God is marked by seeking God for what He can provide rather than who He is. The gifts of God rather than the giver. Perhaps that's a phrase you've heard before. 
Whereas the life under God largely had a fear relationship with God that he might punish us at any moment or at the last day based on what we've done or haven't done. The life over God is largely arrogant or apathetic toward God or tries to control God through behaviors. The life from God is largely devoid of the fear of God's punishment. Jesus took that upon the cross, and now we are seeking him for all that he would give, for all of his gifts, for all of his blessings. This one becomes a little more subtly entrapping, as we'll try to see. The extreme form of it is found in what might be named as the prosperity gospel, a a name it and claim it. Health and wealth, perhaps that's some of your story. It's largely based on our own faith and the strength of our own faith to simply believe that this is who God is and what he will do. If we behave a certain way or act a certain way, if we believe and don't doubt, God will pour out blessing, abundance, gifts. But the problem is we come to him for the gifts, not for the giver himself. And where it becomes entrapping and subtly dangerous is because so many of these truths are found throughout Scripture of God's love and benevolence and generosity and blessings. But it's the attitude and motivation of the heart of his people that is the challenge, is the problem. Now, anyone been around long enough to remember the prayer of Jabez? No one wants to admit it. Maybe you have that book on your shelf still. <laughs> uh, no condemnation, but just an example of a false gospel. First Chronicles 4.10, such a little snapshot picture in, found in, in the Hebrew Scriptures of a man named Jabez who praised, praised God, expand my property, protect me from harm, and keep me from pain. And God answered that prayer. The problem is, like we sometimes so often treat scriptures that are description of what did happen, we simply take them and make them prescription. Therefore, because of Jabez, we too must pray that way. That's the right way to pray. And we miss the larger context and the big story that we know is not consistent to that throughout the scriptures. It may reveal something of God's heart and his goodness and his generosity, but if that alone is on our shelf or on a coffee mug or on our a bumper sticker or just a mantra that we pray, and God isn't doing those things, expanding our territory, our power or possessions or prestige, keeping us from harm, keeping us pain-free in life. What happens when illness comes, when loss comes? Are you not praying hard enough? Do you not, are you not believing enough? So we start to interact with God in a transactional way which can lead to fear, of course, but often in this, this perspective of life from God it usually leads into confusion and then either greater striving or tweaking behaviorism or withdrawing. Again, well, if God is not going to fulfill his end of the deal, then why should I fulfill mine? You see the paths that it could take. These are more of the extreme forms. Uh, Sky Jatani describes The perspective, though many wouldn't name it this way, the perspective of God is he is some form of divine butler or cosmic therapist. He's there when we need him. We often put a a Christian or spiritual veneer on it. God is my ever-present help in time of need. A misquote and distortion of Psalm 46. And even that, right, you're like, I would never call God my divine butler or cosmic therapist. But we may have held beliefs like that because they're repeated so often. He is, is he not? My ever-present help in time of need? See where there's a sliver of truth in that. But if he is only there when we are in need to answer our requests, it's a transactional Life from God, perspective, posture. The research that Sky Dutani spells out, which I don't have to follow, you can read read it, but he would argue, and I think it's 
substantiated that some form of this perspective is the most common and pervasive in the American church. From young to old, God is there, he is loving, he is good, he is benevolent. If I need him, I will go to him, and he will answer. If I don't need him, if things are going pretty well, I can assume he's already blessing, and I will continue on my way. It all falls apart when life falls apart, similar to the other postures as well. But when pain or loss or difficulty or whatever we measure as not blessing, when we see others that seem to be blessed so much more for doing so much less, it starts to fall apart. Maybe there's a seed of doubt somewhere within us. See, the life under God would quickly turn to there must be some sin or some shortcoming, some failure that I have done that either I haven't confessed or haven't repented from or don't even know. So that's the path of the life under God. The life from God takes the other path of I must not believe enough. I must be doubting somewhere. I must root that out. But all of these are a transactional approach, posture. Again, the more subtle form and sadly far more common form in the American church is a relationship not with material blessing. Many move past that and say, okay, I see it. I've read enough scripture. I know that God's people aren't always blessed materially. Look at Job. Start with Job, maybe the oldest portion of Hebrew scripture in existence, a story of God giving and taking away, yet still God loving and present throughout the story. So we read enough scripture, it's not about material blessings or even health. These bodies fail, we will die. Our focus is on what God will do to restore and raise us up for life forever. But in the here and now, there's brokenness, there's loss, there's pain. So we receive that, we understand that, while still wanting the blessings. We say it's not about health and wealth and prosperity. We know But then we look for the spiritual benefits of God's salvation, forgiveness, peace, rest. And you see how this becomes subtly confusing because those are things that God gives and does. It's the motivation and our own heart when we are going to him for only those things, not for communion with him. Communion with him results in those gifts and those blessings. Sky Jatani says, life from God desires God's blessings, but may not be all that interested in God himself. Some can have a much more of a spiritual relationship with the church than with God. They find their belonging, acceptance, meaning, purpose, community, and they're around people of God, and so they too believe that they are with God. But they're going for something that they can receive, experience, more than an experience with God himself, which is a difficult pursuit, isn't it? Okay, so if you're saying this, some of you will be saying this is totally my story. (laughs) This is what I'm trying to walk away from. Some of you are seeing revealing of this is still my 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 story. Others are saying that's not that's not me. One of the other postures is me. We're meant to experience all of these with the with the humble reflection of where 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 is that still within me? And if this is pervasive in the American church. From the extreme to the more subtle, where do we interact with God in this way? Could we be humble enough to reflect? How often is our motivation for prayer, for Bible studies, to hear from God, to have clarity, to have direction or guidance, to have an answer to our pursuit? How often? I'm not saying it should never be. It's right to pursue God for those things. But humbly weigh out how often that's your pursuit uh, in spiritual disciplines, whatever, however you might list that, certainly not, not limited. 
to receive, to know something, to get an answer, to have clarity, to have peace, to receive something versus to be with God. And again, I'm not saying it should only be as soon as you, as soon as you recognize that you're going, going to God to receive those spiritual blessings, you should not go to God. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying measure out, weigh out how often. God loves it when we come to him anytime, anyway, certainly seeking those things. But how often do we come into his presence or desire to simply be with him, to commune with him? Especially when we have big needs. Have you ever chosen a church for what it offers or left the church for what it does not offer? I'm not talking about, let's not, let's separate out theology. <laughs> I hesitate to even say that. Maybe you're evaluating this church based on those terms. It would reveal a consumerist attitude that is pervasive in our culture, really hard to see within our own selves. It's what we're taught is simply normal. Have you ever thought or said, I I didn't get much out of church today or last week or recently? Maybe I'll do something else on Sunday. Brunch sounds nice. Sleeping in sounds nice. Football sounds nice. Maybe I'll go check out my friend's church. Maybe I'll get something from them. This is a consumerist attitude toward a church, a people, or in this case, like what we're doing right now, a service. And If that is our heart or our motivation toward church, it's probably reflective of how we interact with God. Would we humbly reflect on our motivations, on our postures? Consumerism versus community. What we can get versus what we can give. I think many of you have a heart to be, to be a place of belonging and welcome. You come to community knowing that you're needed as much as you're going to receive. You're a blessing as much as you get to be blessed. And I hope that's true. It's not always true. And where you see that revealed, simply bring that heart before the Lord. He welcomes it. He invites us back to know that we are meant to be in relationship and community with him and with one another. And we should have a longing when we're not experiencing that. But may we reflect on where it might lean toward our wants and desires more than our heart to be and to give. I'm glad you're here, all of you. You are a blessing. We're not a perfect church. We say that repeatedly. If you're trying to find one, keep looking. Good luck. But that's why we think we fit here. I think why so many of you believe you've found community here. Would you switch if need to switch? A, I'm there to serve, to give, to be. Even if you don't have an active, specific role. To be present, to love, to welcome. We need you. The prodigal son story that we've looked at throughout this series kind of begins with the life from God. The younger son wants to take his inheritance, totally unheard of. His father answers it and gives it. He's generous. He's loving. But that son shows he's more interested in receiving the gift than in being in relationship with the father. He'll go do life on his terms. And isn't that the same story that we've seen throughout Scripture? All the way back in the very beginning, Genesis 3, 6 When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that was a delight to her eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. You see the parallel story? And in that one specifically, God had given them everything they needed. He was with them intimately, gave to them abundantly, walked with them closely, and they wanted more, or wondered if God was withholding from them, and this looks good, so I will take and eat. 
And so we do the same. The younger son does the same. He's not saying that this wasn't good. He's saying, I want more. I want my inheritance now. I want to go experience other. I want to do life on my own terms. What can you give me, Father? More interested in life from than life with. So we can be, heart, we can be far from God's heart like the prodigal, taking from him, trying to do life, just whatever blessings we can receive and doing life on our own strength, or we can put a spiritual veneer on our life and still be far from him through activities or church attendance or giving some, serving some, praying some, becoming fluent in Christianese, and still be far from God's heart. Jesus condemned the religious, the most religious of his day with those words. Matthew 15, 8, these people honor me with their lips, but what? Their hearts are far from me. They're here, they're present, they're religious, even in their actions and their words. It all sounds good and looks good. He had some harsher words than that. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. They've come up with all of these ways to look holy and look righteous, and they've completely missed the gospel, communion, presence, with God. Their hearts are far. That gets at the very motivation of the heart. So this is nothing new. Conditional, transactional faith. A life from God. Furthermore, not just 2,000 years ago, Jesus was quoting Isaiah, who lived 700 years before him. So this life from God posture has been around for quite a while. Perhaps we have loved ones, friends, Maybe ourselves is a part of our story who have walked away from God when hardship or, or illness or brokenness or loss happens because God has failed us. He hasn't held up his end of the deal. And it just reveals that faith is built on what God provides and will give rather than on a deep love for him. This posture, of course, makes us prone to idolatry Worth taking a moment on that. The theologian John Calvin, paraphrasing, said, a human heart or mind is an idol-making forge or factory. He was one of the first to, to, split, to split idolatry into idolatry of the heart. So a culture like ours would say, maybe, we don't worship idols a golden calf forged out of gold and raised on a pedestal to bow before and worship? No. And John Calvin said that it's, there's so much more in the human heart that's just the same as that. We can worship power, pleasure, control, fame, freedom. Those are obvious ones. And many of us have already experienced those as false gods. We've tasted much of those, and we're still unsatisfied, proving they are a false god to pursue. Sometimes we get, get trapped saying we need more of that or some other recipe. Fame and money and power. Do we see anyone ever in our media with those things that is still not satisfied and not content? Everything I have here on earth is not enough. Maybe I'll go to space and find it. Those are more obvious, okay? What about the less obvious ones? Where we come to God for spiritual things, that then we, be, we make ultimate things. Sometimes we can worship the good life. A good, passionate Healthy marriage, healthy, successful, smart kids who, as they grow, become independent, get married to healthy, smart, strong, sharp spouses, and have beautiful grandchildren to bless us in those days. Have a good career with purpose and meaning and just enough impact and work right life balance and an ability to retire early enough to still travel and bless and give and serve and. So what becomes subtle about this, are any of those things bad things? No. Until they become ultimate things. 
whether it's a full picture of a life or it's any of those individual things that we say, this must be. And if with enough faith and righteous living, God will give and bless in that way. And if that becomes our pursuit, it's transactional and we're approaching God through a false gospel. A personal, personal story. I think God revealed the potential of an idol of success, of affirmation and acclaim within me. When we left here to go serve in Wisconsin and started serving in, in some pretty prominent ways in a church of 3,000 or so and getting a lot of attention and acclaim, even within just a, just a year, some saying I might potentially inherit this, they could see that I could inherit that ministry potentially. And I remember thinking that sounded pretty good. 26, 27, I could see that path. Oh, it's a long ways in the future. I have a lot more room to grow and experience. God very graciously revealed that potential idolatry cloaked in spirituality. And I was able to bring that repeatedly to him and say, Lord, this is horrific. Wherever this lives within my heart, take it. Would you take it? And I replaced that idol with a more subtle idol of knowing that my life made a difference. And this is one I continue to bring before the Lord. A mentor asked me some years into ministry here, Ben, if you gave your entire life in service to Christ and his church and never got to see any impact or difference that you made, would you be content? Would you be at peace with God? So what's yours? Um, think about the things that you desire or are dreaming for. If you're younger, that list is probably bigger. If you get older, that list starts to narrow, but probably has a caption of legacy over it. But whatever that is, I would ask you the same question that my mentor asked me. If you give the remaining remainder of your days in service to Christ, and his church, his bride. And you never get to experience, fill in the blank, will you be content and at peace with God? Oh. See, we can just simply replace idols, especially the ones that look more spiritual, <laughs> sound good, and it's just that subtle turning of the heart to need to make them ultimate, not even to replace God, but to put them right up alongside him. How can we cultivate a life with God that is content in him alone, that when his blessings come, we rejoice. When they're taken, we declare his goodness, his unchanging character of love. Now, we can look to other examples, certainly. We can remember Christ's words, John 15, 4, Abide in me, my followers, my disciples. He prays this on behalf of all who would come after him, but he's speaking to his current disciples, so we receive it. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. You see the order right there in, in Jesus' words. Fruit, blessing, abundance, impact is a gift. It's good, it's beautiful. But first, abide. 
Find your life connected to the vine. The fruit is the result, not what we're striving for, not what we must need. The psalmist says, Psalm 73, 25, 26, Whom am I in heaven but you? Earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Some of these prayers are prayers we pray of reminding. I I love A.W. Tozer's prayer at the end of his first chapter of the pursuit of God. God, I long to long for Thee. I desire to desire You more. Recognizing in himself even a want for more of God and how lacking that is at times. How we are so bombarded with other things that promise that sense of life or fulfillment, and they all fail. What about when life is full of loss or pain or suffering? It is not because God is punishing or withdrawing. Again, we remember Job, where God loves to give and at times will take away. And though his character has not changed, His love has not changed. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We look to Paul. Philippians 4.11. I'm not referring now to being in need, he said, to his brothers and sisters who gave and supported his ministry. For I have learned to be content with whatever I have. Remember, he's writing this, imprisoned in Rome under Nero, and he would not find freedom again. I know what it is to have little. I know what it is to have plenty. But in any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A man who took his whole, it took his whole life to get to a place where he could probably truly say that. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Sometimes it takes our whole life pursuit to be there too. But we're reminded it's possible. Those who have dwelt so closely and abided so closely with the Lord and have found a secret that this world has nothing that it can offer that compares to being near and with God Himself in the power of His Spirit. Paul does give some specific applications for us earlier in that same chapter, Philippians 4, things that we can strive to apply. And maybe we'll leave with this today and respond in worship. Because he tells us, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, these words have some stronger weight from a man who is in his condition and place. Where we get to get up from these comfortable chairs and walk out these doors fellowship for a bit, talk about where we want to go, have a nice full meal, or go experience our kids playing sports today or watch some sports on TV, have another meal tonight, and tuck ourselves into a nice warm bed with a roof over our head that we don't have to worry about leaking in the rain. We have a lot. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is with us. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It will be with you. So finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, but know this, the God of peace is with you. He's with you. May we respond with more gratitude, daily gratitude. May we respond with rejoicing in abundance and in little. May we trust in God's presence and provision, His strength, and maybe we reframe our prayer time. Now, as I, get, as I get older, 
pursued God longer, still have a long ways to go, more and more of my prayer time is spent in silence. Certainly beginning with adoration or some psalms of worship, things that would prompt, prompt that place of silence. I'm not saying just silent, active silence. God, my words are, mean so little. I want to hear from you and be with you. If you would speak, let me hear and not miss. Just coming into God's presence to commune with him. Certainly Jesus teaches us to pray that way. God, you are holy, holy in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And certainly then, give us today our daily bread. Prayers of supplication, prayers of requests are good. Paul reinforced it right there. God loves to give. He does. But above all, he longs for us. He's the Father who sees us and runs and embraces and lifts us up. And what does he declare? My son was dead, but now he is alive. And perhaps we hear that from his perspective. Oh, that father thought his son was gone and dead. He'd been gone for so long. And now he's actually alive because they didn't have cell phones and he didn't know where he was. Is it possible he was declaring something spiritually? My son was dead. But now he's home. He's with me. And if that's any part of our story, any part of your story, there's been something dead in you because you see any of these false postures that we've looked at and said, that's all I've known and all I've been taught. See your Father drawing you back and embracing you and declaring what was dead is now alive. You are with me. Live with me. Dwell with me. Commune with me. All that I have is yours. Would you pray with me? Father, we do declare that you are a giving, benevolent, abundant, loving God who does love to pour out gifts to his children. It's true. Above all, your spirit. The thing we need most, your presence. And we don't want to fail to ask for all the other gifts and abundance that you could give. We seek it. We want healing for those who are sick. We want relief of pain for those who are battling constant pain. We want joy and peace and salvation and grace. We need these things. But above all, may we tune our hearts and our minds to you and commune with you. Today, as we come to the table, as we sing, as we pray, may this be a day where we hear you say, what was dead, I make alive. Rise up. Be with me. Walk with me. May it be true for each of your children here. Thank you. You are loving and pursuing us. May we love and pursue you. For your glory, in the name of Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. Would the team come and lead us in a response? We use this time to respond however the Spirit is prompting you. For some, that means sitting still and meditating, praying, wiping those tears. For others, it will be standing and proclaiming who He is and what He's done. Because rejoicing feels right and good and natural today. Could you sing on behalf of others where that's a stretch today? Where God is meeting with them right now. If you need prayer today, I'm sure Ray would love to pray. I would love to pray. Austin, I'm sure, would love to come and pray. If you need prayer today, come find us. Whether it's in this response time, tap us on a shoulder or linger, and we'd love to pray for you. Respond as you feel that. And we get to come to the communion table being reminded of what Christ has done for us, that we can abide in him and with him. So be reminded of that 
as you partake in the bread and the cup today. Individually, together with those near you, you are welcome anytime as we sing. How many songs do we have today? A few? Three? Four? Four? Okay. I love it. It tells a story. We only did two earlier, so I was making sure we got that fourth in here. Respond as you feel led, church. Okay? Love you. God loves you. This first song is new to us as a church, so I encourage you, again, as Pastor Ben said, to take the posture of worship that feels best for you right now. If that is bowing your head and eyes closed, if it's sitting with arms open wide, if it's standing, if it's kneeling, um, this song was my song of worship this week, and so um, I hope you're blessed.